Welcome to Uncaged. Today, we're speaking with Ross Hastings. Ross is the managing director of Nilo. It is a business design consultancy for a sustainable future. Tell us a little bit about you and how you got to uh, Nilo in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I guess the the one common thread that's run through my career really has been psychology. I'm fascinated by what makes people, uh, groups of people, organizations of people uh, perform at their best. So originally that that path started with an undergrad in psychology. Uh, after that, I went over and that was in, in the UK and Scotland. And, and after that, I went over to Canada and I spent a number of years in the ski industry. And over there, uh, I ran operations across multiple ski schools. Um, I ran a national partnership program uh, championing Banff as a destination uh, to people all over Canada and North America. And in doing those roles, I became really, really fascinated about this kind of interface between the people providing an experience and the people experiencing an experience, for want of a better term. So I got really, really interested in what happens if you create a culture and an employee experience that leads to a fantastic, congruent, passionate delivery of a customer or a visitor experience and how that whole thing becomes, you know, if you can then connect that amazing experience that the customer has back to the actions of the people delivered it, you've got this beautiful virtuous cycle um, of, you know, creating a, a lot of meaning and, you know, well-being um, and great experiences. So that led me to further my psychological studies. I went and did a, a master's of coaching psychology and positive psychology mm -hmm. with a real focus on, you know, leading positive organizations and what positive organizations look like. Um, I still am heavily involved in that area of academia. I, I still uh, supervise students uh, going through a master's in the same topic um, and love keeping on the cutting edge of the academic side of things. But more than that, I'm really passionate about applying that thinking in the real world, kind of bridging that gap between the latest academic thinking and the real world practical environment um, that organizations exist in. Uh, about um, uh, almost four years ago now, I founded uh, Nilo. And what we originally set out to do at Nilo, which is still pretty core to what we do today, is to help organizations have more positive impact on the people that they come in contact with. And we've always had a kind of fairly broad stakeholder view on what that looks like. Uh, but at the core of it is exactly what I described building a, an internal, cohesive, coherent, vibrant, positive culture mm -hmm. uh, through a really uh, a really aligned, authentic employee experience that then leads to the consistent congruent delivery of an amazing customer experience. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said, connecting that back to the, the actions of the employee. So that that's yeah. at the core of what we've always done. Well, I mean, um, Ross, I feel like you have, you know, set up a business at the right time at the right place. That <laughs> is certainly a topic that is central really in broader business today, I would say. And I would say that, you know, we've seen television shows like billions with these leadership coaches and positive coaches. And, and we've seen how they've tried to kind of instill different types of cultures and different types of organizations. We've seen so many businesses start, kind of technology businesses start in space. But you know, tell me a little bit more right now about Nilo and what you feel you guys are focused on right now and what is it that customers are really grokking with? Yeah, good question. So at Nilo just now, um, we're actually going through somewhat of a transition period to adjust to what we're finding organizations um, are, are, are looking for. At, at the core of what we've done has always been purpose. So we've always been about building purpose-driven organizations, helping companies to, to engage their people, clarify purpose, uh, and then to embed it across you know, strategy um, in their strategic choices, the strategic bold decisions that they make um, into their culture and into their brand and their marketing. 
And traditionally, when we set up, we did that as a group of businesses. We basically had a consulting arm and an agency arm. Um, what we found is actually what organizations need now is a more kind of creative, innovative, human-centered focus, uh, mm -hmm. human-centered approach to consulting itself. So as you said earlier, we have uh, consolidated our businesses into a um, into a business design consultancy where we still have the same focus, but we have a, a cohesive approach across uh, kind of creative systems thinking strategy um, that brings that purpose through the, the, the fabric of the organization internally, but also in the story it takes to market. And I, I'd say the other big shift for us has been to take the conversation beyond just purpose. So yeah. as opposed to just a, a purpose-driven organization, which I could argue can be subjectively good or bad. Um, right. You know, some might argue the Death Star and Star Wars is a very purpose-driven organization, right? They were all aligned. They were all passionate. They were bought into the cause. Um, but <laughs> many of us might not say that it was a, a just or a good purpose. So we're right. actually moving more into this space of, okay, what are the kind of purposes that people uh, are finding meaning in now? What what sort of purposes do employees want to be part of? Do customers want to be associated with? Uh, and that takes us in very much into that space of um, you know sustainable growth and into the what's in many spaces been called the you know second uh, second renaissance or the fourth industrial revolution or the sustainable revolution, all that kind of yeah. space. But how how do companies become more resilient and future proof by having a a purpose that is that delivers sustainable growth and gives meaning to the people that they interact with. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, we hear these phrases sustainable. Uh, we, we hear about kind of companies that are trying to build positive cultures, meaningful cultures with purpose. But it's fascinating because I still don't know if in business we've totally gotten our heads around this because you'd think that maybe we do because you see a lot of press about companies doing good things here and there, but I still generally feel like we're just, there's a lot of veneer happening, a lot of veneer work happening. And yet when I sit down with uh, Gen Y and you know, these folks coming up, coming out of college right now. Wow, they truly look at business in such a radically different way. You know, they're certainly interested in having a job, but they, they're they not interested in just like a purpose of like a cool culture anymore. It's not like the Google with the volleyball courts anymore. It's like, hey, listen, how are we going to save this planet? And how are we going to get, I guess, business to make that even more bold shift? Are we getting there? I think you said a couple of things that are absolutely spot on. One um, is the idea of veneer. Uh, I think many companies are, there's general awareness that companies need to do something. Leaders realize they need to do something, but I would say in the most part, it is still veneer-like, right? It's it's action alongside their core business. Yeah. And the first thing I think organizations, or leaders in organizations need to realize is this needs to be your business, not to yeah. be a thing you do in your business. Yeah. Uh, that That's number one. Number two is you mentioned this is a pressing, a pressing need for, well, it is an emerging need for businesses, but it's going to become a pressing need because it's the emerging demographics that are going to really start demanding this. So if companies don't get ahead of the game now, they're going to very quickly be in a very reactionary kind of position later when they realize they're just not attracting employees and customers like they used to. Um, and that, you know, emerging demographics can see through the veneer. Um, and, you know, to your to your final point about how much this is happening, there are some companies that are starting to do a really great job here. Yeah. Um, but obviously the market is awash with you know greenwashing purpose washing and yeah. and for us you know we, we we think that this we think of the this world in kind of this quadrant right so if you think of the two axes of a quadrant one being uh, sustainable action and the other one being sustainable storytelling um you know any company that's not taking any sustainable action or telling a sustainable story at the moment we can think of them in 
the modern business environment as laggards, really. They're, they're behind the game. Um, but a lot of companies, to your point, are telling the sustainable story, but without the action. That's obviously when we're in the space of greenwashing and companies are now actually being sued for that. Yeah. Or directors of companies are being found liable for that. So it's it's becoming a real issue. Um, if you look at the bottom right of of this this quadrant, which is you know really great sustainable action, but not telling a story, I'd say that's unreal unrealized upside. If you're doing really great sustainable things, you need to be able to communicate that to the market. If you're having a net positive impact, in particular, we want more people engaging with what you're doing. So yeah. articulate that story, and then that top right, that sweet spot of sustainable action, sustainable story. Uh, that's where we're seeing sustainable value creation. That's where that's where the the few that are doing a fantastic job embedding it in the very fabric of their business, yeah. um, making it part of their strategy, not alongside their strategy, um, ingraining it in their culture, the way they hire, the way they build capability, the way they um, you know reward people, manage performance, promote people through the organization. Um, and in the very brand positioning of their brand and the way they take their what they do to market the sustainable whether it be kind of societal impact or environmental impact is is ingrained in all of those things of the organizations that are doing it well yeah it's a really interesting time and certainly there are companies that are i'd say beacons for all of us to look at but some larger companies i'd love to see them doing maybe <laughs> Maybe more. I don't know. I've been to too many Davos meetings where uh, lots of promises are made and actions are happening. But but at the end of the day, if you really do the math, the actions aren't going to get us to where we need to go. So that's uh, I think oh, that's sure. the that's the push. Well, and on that, I mean, I was at the uh, over here in Australia. We have the Australian Institute of Company Directors, which is you know basically our our company directors, our board um member body right mm -hmm. and they had their annual governance summit uh, a couple of weeks ago now and, and the focus was um the business of tomorrow and and, mm -hmm. and a really core focus was climate action um and and some other related topics but what was interesting um was just talk about ESG um, and, and taking genuine action. And, and I think one of the core common themes that came out of that, which I completely agree with, and it's great to hear it being talked about in that sort of forum, is that yes, particularly in a public company, but in all companies really, you're going to have shareholder primacy, right? Mm -hmm. that, 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 that probably is going to remain. Um, but you need to have stakeholder focus. And, and what companies need to realize is that sh short-term focus on shareholder only, i.e. the short-term focus on profit, mm -hmm. actually means you don't have a resilient business that's built for the future. So you won't be delivering long-term shareholder value anyway. So paradoxically, you need to focus on the long-term needs of key stakeholders, your customers and your employees, your communities, planet as a stakeholder, and then you will deliver long-term shareholder value. So it's kind of this paradoxical view on the world. And it's tied in with, you know, the whole notion of triple bottom line, um, which, you know, still stands. I think it's been maybe misused or misunderstood. But this whole idea that you want to be having a net positive impact on um, people and planet, but also, of course, your profit as well. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's important. It's not an expensive profit. And we would argue actually to be profitable in the future you're going to have to be thinking about your impact on people and planet now today yeah absolutely well let's shift gears a little bit ross and talk about you i mean it was an amazing story that we heard about how you got going in this industry and um really kind of a, an international story of experiences but now you've built up here at nilo and you and the team are are really, I'd say, in one of the most critical spaces in business. What gives you passion? What drives the passion for you and what you do? And where do you find the joy in your work? Yeah, it's a really good question, considering what we do and our passion for, for finding that for others. But I think there's a couple of parts to it. One, um, myself and the people um, in Nilo, we're all really passionate about 
solving problems, mm-hmm. um, challenging problems, and, and being able to articulate the system behind those problems in order to provide clarity uh, towards solutions and being innovative and creative in that in that process. Um, and doing that towards a problem that we find really meaningful is something that's that, that, that's really, really important to us. So we like big, hairy problems. We don't search for easy solutions or, you know, no, you know, quick wins maybe, but quick wins in pursuit of a, you know, a bigger, more impactful solution. So that's one. Um, the second one is that, you know, this is back to my psychology roots. My leaning in psychology has always been, I was never really that um, compelled towards kind of clinical psychology or any of the kind of de- what you might call deficit-based psychologies where we're, right. we're working with clinical conditions. Great work, but it just wasn't my passion. Um, hence, my master's in positive psychology are really drawn towards this idea of the psychology of optimal performance, right? Like how do we take someone that's just seemingly going through an average normal life and mm-hmm. actually take that to a feeling of kind of uh, real meaning, real purpose, optimal performance, which is why your question is interesting because it's basically the question you asked is how yeah. do we get people waking up every morning really excited about what they're off to do that day? Um, so I that drives me, but I would love to find a way to make that the results of that more tangible and Mm -hmm. i say that because obviously there's a self-serving element to that i would love to see um really tangibly the impact that the work we're doing here at nilo is having on people in the world and the planet Uh, but that problem is also something that is going to help the dynamic we were talking about earlier with organizations if we can make your profit is a really tangible thing if we can make societal and environmental impact as tangible um, and as valued, then I think that's going to have a, a, a real impact in this space. So there's a there's a self-serving element to that, but there's also a you know an organizational element to it. So you know, Ross, it's really interesting because I'd say you know driving culture is something that you have to. I'd say kind of get buy-in from every aspect of a business to shift it. Uh, One of the things I would say that as a leader I've learned is whilst you might think the culture of your business is one way, it will evolve and shape in other ways as the next generations start to become stronger voices and really kind of uh, basically make their mark in the businesses, which is excellent. I mean, I think that's probably a sign of a healthy business. But Mm. um, do you balance what your work with kind of, I'd say, the coaching for individuals and executives with the brand? I mean, if you were to work with, let's say, a customer, and uh, they were trying to achieve, let's say, a shift in their focus, or they knew, generally speaking, that they were perhaps an efficient operation, but a purposeless operation Mm -hmm. and something that ran the risk of being commoditized. So as a leader, they had diagnosed that broadly, but in some ways them as a leader, whilst they might've diagnosed that problem, how you shift their thinking in a way to be more Mm -hmm. focused on performance and positive thinking, not only shifting the broader structure at the same time, how do you deal with that kind of Double play, so to speak. Yeah, it's a it's a very good question. There's a couple of parts to that. So I think in order to build buy-in um, with an exec for that kind of purpose-driven change, uh, what one is is to recognize that you have a purpose, mm-hmm. right? So just because a consultancy hasn't come in and you know worked through articulating that with you. There's a purpose in an organization. A purpose is a you know a living, breathing ecosystem of living, breathing people. There's a reason yeah. that those people are there or joined. There's a reason that they're still there. There's a reason that they act and behave and value the things that they do. Um, so I would say that you have a purpose and, and that's guiding your people. And you probably, when you're a certain size of business, want to be on on top of what that is yeah um 
But the second part of that, I would say, is that, and, and my view of this is biased because I work with the leaders that value what we do and bring us in. Right. Right. So uh, usually there's a challenge. Usually there's an issue. Usually there isn't a perfectly working, efficient organization that's able to uh, hire and maintain and grow the employees that they want to and cut through in a competitive market and have sustainable growth those things are usually one of one or more of those things are usually not happening if we're being brought in so i think there is usually a defined need there and i would argue that that need is is probably growing amongst say the naysayers in this space as well um right. and on top of all of that i would say that if 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 there's a i guess a a grudging willingness to do the work, let's say, you know, they want to do some purpose work, they want to build kind of more sustainable growth. We work with exec, but we will never work with a client who refuses to, to open up, or turn up the volume, as we call it, like bring in stakeholder voice, speak to their employees, speak to their yeah. customers, bring external perspective in. And I'd say if they start off uh, grudgingly, then very quickly when they hear some of the perspectives of stakeholders that that the need emerges uh, pretty rapidly. Yeah, and pretty the gap rapidly. in understanding between execs and people is pretty obvious. Yeah, obvious. pretty obvious. Absolutely. Well, Ross, let's shift gears again and talk about 2023. So internationally, we face a lot of challenges economically right now. What's your hope for this year and what's on the docket for Nilo? Well, my hope is that we start to um, we start to get more buy-in, more realization that this focus on on sustainable growth, on on kind of aligning environmental and societal impact or net net positive impact alongside profit, gets more traction and and more realization. Uh, I would ultimately, I don't think it's going to happen in 2023, but I'd love to see a future where companies are com competing primarily on the positive impact they're having across all three of those triple bottom line mm -hmm. elements, as opposed to uh, just growth or market share or, <clears throat> or profit or shareholder returns. So I hope we start to see the dial move there in 2023. I think we are going to see some traction. Um, I think there's a growing realization that to have a resilient business, you need to be focusing on these things. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really optimistic that we're going to see um, a shift in 2023 and beyond. And if we start to see some of the policy level of conversations that are happening um, and, you know, climate, uh, climate action time horizons moving from kind of 2050 where they originally were to 2030, that's not so very far away. So um, I think the whole conversation around this space, not only in for-profit, corporations that we work with but you know at a policy level um and a global level it, it's the time horizons for these things are now in the kind of seven year mark right. uh, so if they're even remotely realistic we're going to see uh accelerating shifts happening this year and and beyond yeah, absolutely. Well, Ross, amazing to talk with you today. I've really enjoyed learning about Nilo. If someone wanted to actually get in touch with you and get a better understanding of the day-to-day -day work that you're doing, or perhaps hire you guys, uh, where's <laughs> the best place to reach you? Uh, always more than happy to hear from people directly. So uh, anyone who wishes to speak to me uh, personally can get me at Ross, R-O-S-S -S, at Nilo.com. That's N-E hyphen L-O dot com. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn and love sharing our ideas. We, we're passionate about this stuff. So we share most of our thinking and most of our ideas fairly openly. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn, usual usual way, just uh, just search for Ross Hastings. Um, and uh, I'm the one that's got MICD after my name. So it should be pretty obvious which one I am. Mm -hmm. And then of course, just check us out at uh, nilo.com. Again, N-E hyphen L-O.com. Well, thank you so much for being on Uncage Day, Ross. We've been speaking with Ross Hastings. He's the managing director at Nilo. We've been talking a lot today about positive psychology, coaching psychology, purpose, building purpose inside of organizations. And that's really where Nilo and the Nilo group are focused. They focus on 
blending specialist consulting research and agency services to help companies clarify their purpose and transform strategy, brand, and culture. Ross, thank you so much for taking us through what you and the team are working on, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you for having me. That was fun. Cheers.